Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. My name is John Donnelly. I'm a reporter with CQ Roll Call, and I chair the Press Freedom Committee at the National Press Club. Well, it's World Press Freedom Day, which every year is a day to celebrate free expression, press freedom, transparency, and also to unflinchingly examine where those values are at risk. Today, we are here to talk about one story of one journalist who is in peril. Emilia Gutierrez Soto is his name. He is a journalist, he is from Mexico, and Mexico is a very dangerous place to be a journalist. Emilio worked as a reporter in Chihuahua, and he covered the drug cartels there. He covered corruption in the Mexican army. And one night, about 13 years ago, uh, soldiers invaded his home on the pretext of a drug raid, but that was phony. Uh, they were clearly there to intimidate him for what he had written. They seized his, uh, his domestic documents, ID documents. And he knew at that point, because he saw what happened to other journalists who had written critical stories about the cartels and the government, he knew that his life was in danger and that one of his only choices was going to be to flee to the United States. And uh, well, really his only choice. Um, and so in June, 2008, uh, Emilio and his then teenage son, Oscar, uh, legally entered the United States. And upon arrival, he was separated from his son. He was detained by immigration authorities for about six months, uh, whereupon he was released uh, as his asylum case uh, was pending. And then about 10 years later, in 2017, his asylum was uh, uh, denied. And uh, that was followed by another appeal, another stint in detec detention, another denial. This has gone on for 13 years, and it's not over. Um, in the meantime, Emilio has been recognized by organizations such as the National Press Club uh, for his courage in the face of adversity. We gave him our uh, John Obershawn Press Freedom Award, which is the highest distinction that we confer on uh, journalists. And um, he has worked also as a, a, a journalism fellow at the University of Michigan, something that we will hear a little bit about. So the bottom line here, we're talking about a journalist whose life was in danger in Mexico and still is, should he return, who sought refuge in the home of the free and the land of the brave and 13 years running. Uh, he's not only been denied asylum, but he's been subject to indignity and pain in the process. To talk about this case today, we have two of the very finest people around who know this issue and know the story of Emilio and who have been intimately and passionately involved in it. First of all, Lynette Clementson is with us. She is the director of the Knight Wallace Journalism Fellowship Program at the University of Michigan. Uh, where Emilio uh, was uh, a fellow um, uh, in 2018, 2019. Um, and Lynette is uh, an alumna of NPR, of uh, New York Times and Newsweek, and we're very happy to have Lynette with us today. And secondly, Kathy Kiley, uh, a professor at the University of Missouri School of Journalism, where she holds the Lee Hills Chair in Free Press Studies. Uh, Kathy was the National Press Club Journalism Institute's Press Freedom Fellow for several years, including for a good chunk of the time when uh, we were handling the Emilio case, uh, which we still are. Um, and she's become a committed advocate for his uh, for his uh, seek, for his getting uh, asylum. Uh, Kathy also has a distinguished track record in the news business. She worked for several major newspapers, notably including USA Today. So with that, to sort of set the scene, um, I want to maybe first turn to Kathy. Um, I gave a, a little thumbnail sketch here, but tell us what else do listeners need to know about um, Emilio's case, uh, particularly maybe that first decade leading up to the 2017 uh, court decision? Well, I think, you know, John, you've stated it really well. I think the, the key factor here is that Emilio did everything that U.S. immigration authorities have said an immigrant or a, an asylum seeker should do. 
He came here legally. He entered the country legally. He applied for asylum when he crossed the border with his young son. And uh, despite that, and then he lived legally in the United States uh, in uh, the El Paso area in Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is right across the border, uh, for many, many years. He, he earned his own living. He was uh, a law-abiding uh, resident of the United States, as was his son. And uh, when, uh, really, I, I have to say that it was the beginning of uh, 2017, um, Donald Trump, who is, uh, was not a friend of Mexicans or journalists, uh, had just been uh, inaugurated president. And within a few weeks after that, um, Emilio began to be um, subject to some harassment. Um, and it really came to a head um, a number of months later after he spoke at the National Press Club. And I think that is a key uh, factor here that um, he began, he was denied asylum that summer, he appealed. Um, we asked him to come to the National Press Club to represent, we, the, the award that year was going to Mexican journalists. And uh, we and our allies in the free press movement, people like uh, Reporters Without Borders and Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, thought he would be an appropriate person because he had fled the kind of dangers we were trying to call attention to. And that seemed to really set off the authorities. And, uh, and that seemed to, you know, much to our regret, uh, start to put a spotlight on Emilio in a way that was um, not very welcome. And so uh, we feel and we argued successfully uh, that Emilio was uh, targeted because he is a Mexican and he is a journalist and um, the federal judge agreed with us. And so Emilio was detained a second time, as you said, by uh, DHS, but um, we, filed, we had to file a writ of habeas corpus um, to get Emilio out. And the only other thing I'll say before turning it over to Lynette is how many distinguished people and organizations worked in this cause. The National Press Club, the Bishop of El Paso, the Knight Wallace uh, Fellowships at the University of Michigan, the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, the Reporters Without Borders, uh, IAPA, the Inter-American Press Association, and um, many, many lawyers volunteered their time, including uh, the Rutgers uh, Law Clinic. Um, and so we had Chuck Tobin, who is of course a great First Amendment lawyer we all know, and um, a number of his colleagues. So what this says to me is you have all these people and all these terrific organizations saying, let this man stay. He has a legitimate asylum case. We had members of Congress uh, supporting his case. And nonetheless, uh, the immigration officials would not release him and would not tell us why they wouldn't release him until we got a court order. So uh, that's where things stood. That's what enabled uh, Emilio to go to Michigan. But we are still waiting for him to be out of legal limbo and be permitted to stay in this country where he has been a law-abiding and very productive resident for, as you say, more than a decade. Yeah. And I mean, the litany of, of supporters that you just read off is stunning. Right. And, and it makes me think to myself, uh, if this is what happens to somebody who has such a legitimate claim, such a, uh, you know, a reason to network be of in, allies. Yes. In a yes. network of allies. If this is what happens to somebody like that, imagine somebody who, who lacks any kind of similar support and then what happens to them. It almost seems like a, uh, you know, a, a tale that that says a lot about the broken state of immigration in, in this country. That's a big and separate subject, but, uh, you know. Absolutely, and that's why journalism is so important because that's how journalists think. If And, and I said exactly that to uh, various people from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, bureaucracy as well as DHS, and I said, look, I'm trained to deal with bureaucracies and I'm having a hard time getting a straight answer. What's it like for somebody for whom English is not their native language? Um, right. That, you know, <laughs> yeah. we, are, we are a country um, built by refugees and immigrants. And if we don't respect our roots, 
uh, what kind of a country are we becoming? Yeah, yeah. All right, Lynette, I want to get get you get you in here. Um, so I talk a little bit about we've already mentioned, um, you know, uh, Emilio's uh, fellowship at the University of Michigan in your program. Talk a little bit about sort of how that came to be and uh, and and just how that story unfolded. Absolutely, and it and it segues perfectly from Kathy's statement about the legions of people involved in this. Um, the National Press Club reached out to me in late winter, early spring of 2018, and it was a, a simple actual request. They were they were filing a friend of the court brief, and they were um, amassing support and looking for signatures of new journalism organizations to support this. And so that was my first formal connection with the National Press Club on this, but I had been familiar with Emilio's case from a story that had been written many years before in Mother Jones um, about the early years of his case. And it was a signal just how long this injustice had been going on by the time, I mean, I came in at the 10 year mark, right? Uh, it had been playing out for a long time. And so I was familiar with the case and agreed to sign on. But in looking at what the National Press Club was doing, learning the facts of where things stood at that moment, um, and Emilio was in detention at that point, it was clear that there was some connection to his having spoken uh, the previous fall at the National Press Club event, because he had never, in the 10 years prior to that second detention, Emilio and his son Oscar had never missed a scheduled check-in with ICE, right? Imagine if we had to live our daily lives once a month checking in with a government entity and scheduling our work and our life and our schooling around that. They had never missed a scheduled check-in. Uh, and in December of 2017, they went for one such scheduled check-in and were detained. So imagine that we all left our house in the morning to do something that was a regular part of our lives and simply never went home. They were detained. And so in thinking about where the case was at that point, um, I realized that I actually run a fellowship for journalists at the University of Michigan and that there was perhaps something more that I could do than simply sign on. And um, Kathy and I and others at the National Press Club started a conversation about what um, it might mean to offer a place in the next class of the Knight Wallace Fellows to Emilio. And I uh, went out to El Paso and I met with Emilio and Oscar in the detention center. Um, that was the first time we met and, you know, in a room with two way glass with guards around watching our interaction and talk to them about the fellowship. I was just somebody who like just showed up. They they um, were unaware of what the fellowship did. And but we but we ended up extending uh, the fellowship to Emilio. And then this other very pivotal moment that Kathy talks about being grant the fellowship is a prestigious fellowship, but being granted the fellowship alone did not um, turn the wheels to get them out of detention. The thing that turned the wheels to get them out of detention was a judge ruled that documents needed to be turned over. Uh, and, and it was that in July of 2018 that all of a sudden we got word that they were being released. And it happened to be within a week of this court ruling that documents had to be turned over. So clearly there was something in those documents that they did not want the National Press Club to see. And rather than risk turning over those documents, they released Emilio and Oscar. At that point, um, I was able to fly out to El Paso and bring them to Ann Arbor. And, um, and Emilio spent the fellowship year uh, as our other fellows do. He was with a class of journalists from around the world studying, but I want to point out that he arrived in much different shape than the other journalists in our program. And, and um, you know, he arrived having been separated from his son yet again, 
after eight months in detention and was clearly traumatized. And, um, and so the, yes, the fellowship stepped up to help him, but it's also worth pointing out that during his time in Michigan, this list of supporters that Kathy mentioned grew even more um, because other uh, supporters at the University of Michigan became involved and invested in his case. One of the, the judge who had denied Emilio detention, uh, one of the more ridiculous parts of his reasoning, and there were many ridiculous parts of this judge's reasoning, was he simply failed to accept that Emilio was a journalist. It was a core part of the decision. He said, you are not a journalist, even though Emilio's lawyer submitted over 150 clips of Emilio's to this judge, and the judge never read them with the uh, argument that, well, they were in Spanish. He couldn't read Spanish, so he didn't take that into account as evidence. So a unit of the university took on um, a volunteer mission to translate those articles into English so that the judge would have no reason to deny them. More than 100 volunteers showed up over a translate-a-thon over one weekend second year Spanish students, um, people who lived in the community, journalists from the program who were Spanish speakers spent the weekend uh, translating Emilio's stories to get them ready to send back to Emilio's um, attorney to submit into evidence. And um, so after that was done, there was no way to argue that Emilio wasn't a journalist. And yet, in March of 2019, the fellowship is one academic year. So toward the end of the academic year, the judge ruled again against Emilio and uh, ordered his deportation. And it was at that point that, um, that Representative Debbie Dingell and Fred Upton, Debbie Dingell, a Democrat, Fred Upton, a Republican stepped in and submitted a letter to the acting head of ICE at that point, um, urging them not to deport Emilio and um, speaking up for justice in his case, again, stating the obvious that this was a very straightforward legal asylum case. And, um, and Debbie Dingell and Fred Upton um, submitted a private bill supporting uh, asylum for Emilio's case. And that was all in 2019. So we are now at the 13 year mark from when Emilio legally entered the country and his case still sits in limbo. And so I'm pleased that the National Press Club for World Press Freedom Day this year is drawing attention to his case yet again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the translate-a-thon is to me one of the more inspiring and frustrating parts of this whole story. Inspiring that so many people took their personal time and volunteered to, you know, to get this stuff translated, you know, really quickly to get it to the judge. And then tell me if I have this right. The judge basically said, oh, I never said he wasn't a journalist. That's I mean, right. it was like, it was like Linus and the football, you know, the football kept moving. And, um, and, you know, we were there, I, I want to say this, um, there's so much about this case that can only be explained by um, a sense of gr grudge carrying and uh, punitive behavior rather than justice and mercy at work. Um, because uh, I was down uh, in El Paso for the argument of that case with Lynette and um, even though we had been scheduled and even though uh, we, we had asked that the case be moved to Michigan, the judge refused that, um, Emilio and his son arrived at the courthouse on time for a 9 a.m. hearing and were told, oh, the judge isn't ready. We've lost some papers. And so they had to wait until about five o'clock in the afternoon, at, at which point the judge did not want to call Lynette as an expert witness. And when he did, he only did so grudgingly and asked her if she needed a translator. So 
I mean, I, I, there was so it much. Was, there was so much that happened that day for anyone who wanted to know how the system really works. There was so much in that day that seemed to be structured around um, very open displays of disrespect. While Amelia was testifying that day, the judge stood up twice to adjust the blinds in the courtroom while Amelia was speaking. And he just stood up from his, from his bench, walked over to the side of the room and decided he was going to play with the sunlight and the blinds in the room. Uh, there were, again, a asking me if I needed a translator, um, which there wouldn't have been a problem if I had, but it was an indication that he hadn't even paid attention to who was speaking. Um, and there was, there was a lot that was direct and there was a lot that was very coded um, that goes to all the other kind of coding that um, people like Emilio and people like myself uh, experience all the time. And it was all on display. And, um, you know, it's, it is one thing, you know, I think in some conversations about this case, we talk about how strong Emilio has been through all of this, because I think as Americans, we like narratives of resilience, right? Look how long this has been going on. And isn't it great that Emilio and Oscar are holding on so long and aren't they resilient? Because when we talk about resilience, that allows us to feel good about ourselves. And I think we're in a moment in this country where people are pushing back and saying, no, I'm not gonna actually talk about how resilient I am. I'm gonna talk about how unjust you are and how unjust the system is. And let's shine light on the broken system and let's try to make the system accountable. Um, yeah. And that's where we are and, and, and people need to not forget about this case and we need to make the system accountable because this is an injustice at multiple levels and it has been an injustice for 13 years. Yeah, and I mean, and that's what you said is absolutely true. Even if it is also true that, that Emilio and his son have been resilient, Sure, they've been resilient, but that doesn't that that, that doesn't minimize their their the the messed up nature of the system, and also the personal and professional toll on Emilio in particular. I'm I want you to talk a little bit, Lynette, about that because you've seen that firsthand. What it's yes, been I've like. I've seen it up him. close. Yes, I mean when you consider that Emilio was in a class with eighteen other journalists from around the world who rallied around his case, certainly, but used the fellowship as all journalists do, to come to spend a year working on, on deep research in an area of their reporting, and then going back and leaving the fellowship one academic year later to do their best work, right? And to move their careers forward and to re-engage with the profession. And while the rest of the journalists in his class were preparing to take what they learned from the fellowship and engage in the world. At the same time as that was happening in March of 2019, Emilio had deportation orders issued against him. And, um, and I've had a chance to watch over, over the past three years, the toll that that took. There were people who offered for Emilio to do freelance writing, but you have to, realize that writing for Emilio is the source of his trauma. It is what upended his life, right? He wrote mm -hmm. a, a, a very simple story in 2005 about petty corruption. Uh, and it just happened to be that the perpetrators of that corruption were military, um, were, were members of the military and he was targeted for that. And so the act of re-engaging with journalism while his case is still up in the air and while he knows it's not just his life, but his son's life um, made it, has made it impossible really for him to re-engage with writing. And it is not that he wanted to leave his profession. 
he was forced to leave his profession. And, you know, I, I want to add to that. This is a case of censorship. It's censorship that was started by Mexican authorities, corrupt Mexican authorities, but it has been aided and abetted by U.S. authorities. That's right. Because what we want is we want the journalism to survive. And the irony is all of these people who say, oh, we're worried about the, the security of U.S. borders and, oh, we want to make sure that people aren't coming here illegally. Well, if you don't want people to come here illegally, fix the situation in their home country. And, the and journalism way, is a part of that. Exactly. Journalism, journalism is the enemy of corruption. And corruption is what drives people to leave their homes and move to another place, a strange place where they don't want to go, but they have to. They're fleeing corruption. And so, um, so the irony of the, you know, the, the, counter, uh, the counterproductive um, methods that are being employed here to supposedly secure the border are, um, are just insane. And so I, you know, I think we, I think the lesson from this is um, we need to do what we can to help journalists keep doing their job, uh, whether it's supporting them in their home countries, or whether it's providing programs where they can do, uh, we just had a journalist here at Mizzou uh, from Pakistan who is still doing killer journalism, but it's cross-border journalism because he can't go home right now. Uh, so I think we need to be imaginative about uh, thinking of ways that we can support our journalism colleagues who are in danger uh, and let them keep doing their work. Uh, That's right. This, this is censorship by the U.S. government, in my opinion. That is right. And as we talk about, Kathy, as we talk about, you know, one of the things I think that that everyone fears with cases that are dormant, like Emilio's, that are well over a decade old, is that those cases are pushed farther back by the backlog of the of recent years right of, of all of all of the mess of immigration and asylum seeking over the past five years uh, that 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 the new tangle has pushed existing cases even farther back but if our administration now wants to be able to deal with the recent problem, they can simply ease their backlog by dealing with and settling very straightforward cases like Emilio's. This yeah. case should be open and shut. It well, is as clean an asylum case uh, as there can possibly be. And, and so why do we still have, why are taxpayers still paying to keep systems, cases like Emilio's tied up in the system uh, when there are very easy solutions. Yeah, and you and I saw that. I mean, we saw attorneys from the Justice Department, people from the Department of Homeland Security, not to mention the judges and the court system, all tied up that day in El Paso with this case that shouldn't even be a case. And this, right. this is taxpayer dollars being used um, to, to really, um, persecuted journalist instead of actually going after the real bad guys. Um, so I think taxpayers need to be alarmed by the misuse of their resources in this case. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, one in, in the 2019 decision, as I recall, one of the things the judge said was that because so much time has passed since Emilio was a journalist 13 years ago or 12, I guess at the time, in Mexico, he's pro his life is probably not in danger now. Easy for the judge to say, right? That was absurd. Um, it was it was absurd. The the year in which he was saying that, Mexico had hit, hit its highest point. I believe that year, twenty one journalists. I have to go back and check that, but it, it was a very high number of journalists had been killed in Mexico, and the years in which. The, the, from the time Emilio was um, uh, picked up in 2017 to the end of the fellowship, there had been this spike in killings of journalists in Mexico. And so, so again, the judge demonstrated that he wasn't even trying. He, like, he was just winging it. He wasn't even trying to deal with the facts of the case. Yeah, and I, I can't get past this point. <laughs> The judge in the original uh, denial, the first the first time around, 
said that he hadn't read the 150 or so clips from Emilio because he doesn't speak Spanish. How is that an issue at an immigration in an immigration court? The inability to understand Spanish. I mean, the judge himself should speak Spanish, but surely they should have a translator at the ready, right? Yeah, well, and you know, everything about that case was um, indicated there was no serious look being um, put on whether or not Emilio had a legitimate case. I mean, his clips were ignored. And as I say, you know, Lynette had written a letter to the judge in which um, her credentials were outlined. Um, her credentials were outlined again in the application to, um, to be an expert witness. And uh, so, and the judge is going to ask somebody who's worked for National Public Radio and the New York Times if she needs a translator. I mean, so it, it was like asleep at the switch. But I think the other important thing here to note is there was another judge who, who was involved in this case, and that was not an immigration judge who really works for the Department of Justice, not the judiciary system. And that immigration judge was the one who decided against Emilio. But once Emilio was detained uh, in December, uh, after he spoke at the National Press Club. 2017. And, and in fact, uh, the, the DHS tried to deport him um, without uh, giving his attorney an opportunity to appeal to the Bureau, uh, to the, uh, Bureau of Immigration Appeals, the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, and luckily, the Board of Immigration Appeals got back just before they could take Emilio across the border. So this is like, this guy's been subject to real psychological torture. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, instead of releasing him, um, the Immigration Service detained him and uh, tried to send him to a place that was very far away from El Paso, away from his friends, away from his family, away from his attorney. Um, and it was only a press club news conference that turned that around and um, a speech that you made, John. Um, and so we got him back to El Paso, but the detention continued despite the appeals of all these press groups and the Bishop of El Paso and all of the people I named. And we kept asking, why? Is there something we're missing here? Why are you detaining this man? Which also is a cost to the taxpayers. And because we couldn't get an answer, the National Press Club filed a freedom of information request to get all of the internal communications regarding Emilio's case, thinking, well, maybe we'll find an answer. And uh, we got very little, it was very redacted, but it was enough to convince the federal judge in the habeas case when we went to say, you can't keep detaining this guy for no reason, that judge agreed. And that was the judge who said, DHS, we want all of these communications. I want to see them. I want to see all of your communications about Emilio Gutierrez. And instead of releasing the communications, they released Emilio. So something is there. The National Press Club has renewed its Freedom of Information Act request. I want to give a shout out to the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press because they are our attorneys in this case. And we are not going to give up because there is something there and we're gonna find out what it is. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, there's, you mentioned earlier the timing issue here, you know, for them to release Emilio rather, right when, right when the deadline was coming up for them to have to produce documents. And then in case people haven't caught the, caught, caught the chronology here in 2017, um, it was in October of 2017 that Emilio, received uh, the award for uh, the John Obershawn Press Freedom Award at a black tie dinner at the National Press Club. And he criticized the US immigration system. And he talked about the, the great darkness, as he called it, uh, in Mexico for, for journalists. Two months later, he is without warning deported or, or attempted to be deported and only at the last minute snatched before he can, before they actually do it, then they end up detaining him. So that's the chronology here. And it does beg the question of whether, you know, some of these things were sort of acts of retribution. Um, yes, and I just, uh, I've been reading over um, under the agreement with the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, um, DHS has to produce uh, documents uh, about 
produce documents for us under our Freedom of Information Act request. It is, they are still heavily redacted, um, but I did come across one in which the press release from the National Press Club announcing that Emilio would be speaking at the Fourth Estate Dinner was highlighted and being shown around DHS. So I think it corroborates our suspicion that, um, that he was targeted. He was targeted for speaking out uh, mm -hmm. in the country that enshrines freedom of speech in its First Amendment. Yeah, yeah. Pretty funny, uh, pretty, not funny, funny, not funny uh, timing there. Um, so let's let's uh, move it up to the uh, the present uh, present tense um, and talk a little bit. Uh, maybe Lynette tell us um, you know where he stands right now. His his fellowship there is over, um, but he's still living in Ann Arbor, right? Um, Correct. So what, give us an update of where things stand right now. So the fellowship ended in uh, April of 2019. And at the time, Emilio considered briefly going back to New Mexico. Um, if you think back to the environment at that time, the issues around the border were really um, tense at that time. There, was, there were um, militias who were rounding up people who uh, they suspected of being illegal immigrants on their own and taking them to take them to ICE. People in, in New Mexico said, stay where you are, you are safe in Michigan. And, um, and Emilio and his now adult son, Oscar, um, both found work in Ann Arbor. The community has really rallied around uh, both of them. And, um, so they're, they're both working in the food industry. Emilio took up painting uh, as therapy for himself during the fellowship. And uh, he put a lot of time into painting and actually had an art exhibit that was sponsored by a local Ann Arbor um, organization. And so they've been living their life in Michigan, but still very much in limbo. Um, Emilio would like to get back to his career. Um, Oscar would like to pursue a culinary school. And, you know, to, sh to show you the sort of the fine ways in which this kind of limbo holds people up, uh, I was talking with Oscar about just enrolling in a program at our local community college, which has a good culinary program. And I said, well, let's just get your records from when you were um, taking classes in New Mexico. But again, remember, they left their house one morning and never got to go back for their things, right? Mm -hmm. They just mm -hmm. dropped out of their life. Mm -hmm. And so all of the things and the documents that we might reach for that, that, that we would have in a file cabinet somewhere that would allow us to pursue continuity in our life, the connections that we had with people, even knowing if the people, the professors or the people who he took courses with before even know that he's still alive. Um, all those connections were broken very abruptly. And so small decisions that you might make uh, in the course of whatever constitutes moving your life forward are that much more difficult for them. Uh, and, you know, those of us who have befriended them here, see those, see those small ramifications and those injustices that they're reminded of daily, but they are full members of their community with friends and jobs. And um, I will say Emilio is, is not a fan of the winter. <laughs> He's definitely a Southwestern man. Um, and so Michigan winters are not kind to him, but, um, but they're, they're holding on. And I, and I think that, you know, there was, there was a lot of anticipation and hope around a new administration. There is still hope that as this administration tries to clean up some of the, um, some of the mess created in the last several years, that maybe there will be, someone will notice that their case is still sitting here. And, that, and, and take an honest look at the case and turn things around for them. Um, 
but at a practical level, things aren't any different for them now than they were uh, a year ago. They are still very much in limbo. Yeah, they're okay. free. They're free from detention, but they're not free to live. They're not free to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is absolutely correct. And mm -hmm. I think the other the other point I would make, um, just to underscore what Lynette said, Oscar and Emilio are people who have made friends wherever they go. Um, they have contributed to their communities. At every one of these hearings and every time we've done something for Emilio, he has friends from El Paso and Las Cruces and Ann Arbor. People show up for him, ordinary Americans. They're all saying, we want this guy to be our neighbor. All of us journalists are saying, we want this guy to be our colleague. And for whatever reason, uh, the government that's supposed to represent us is turning a deaf ear. And the arbitrary nature of what door you come through in the United States. It, I think, you know, we have to point out too that Emilio has friends, colleagues, fellow journalists who entered the United States for similar reasons, seeking asylum um, legally in the same way that he did, but they came through Florida or they came through California. And those people, in one case, one of those people has had asylum granted and is now a US citizen. Mm -hmm. And so, so the added injury of knowing that you are being penalized further simply because you came through the door legally in Texas mm -hmm. and got a judge who, whose record uh, was in the high 90% uh, denial rate, right? That's, that's the door Emilio came through. So again, there's nothing that, about the system that suggests he shouldn't have gotten asylum. It is that he came through the wrong door. And imagine what it is like to know that when you go to sleep every night, right? That it was the luck of the draw that you came in the door and got the judge who was almost guaranteed not to give your case a fair hearing. Yeah, yeah, it's just one outrageous detail after another in the story. It's just, you know, dumbfounding, uh, random bull. <laughs> um, so let's talk uh, what comes next here. Uh, his, his, uh, his appeal uh, of his asylum denial is pending, right? Is there a court case coming up? Is there any kind of expectation about when the next step is going to happen here? Well, you know, elections have consequences, right? And, and his case is now with the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, but the Board of Immigration Appeals is made up of uh, judges who are appointed. Um, and the last administration, as they did with judicial positions around the country, made sure that it was well represented on the Board of Immigration Appeals. And mm -hmm. so we have a new administration that may be more inclined to a more just immigration law and asylum law. Uh, but it's the Board of Immigration Appeals, uh, it's, it's hard to say where they would come out on this now. The, Emilio's case sits with them. And um, we haven't, we checked in with Emilio's attorney and there has been no movement from the Board of Immigration Appeals, not even um, sometimes uh, an attorney, um, the Board of Immigration Appeals will ask the attorney to submit any new papers or, and that's an indication that maybe they're getting ready to engage with the case. There's been no movement whatsoever. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, 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 it's still in waiting. Right. I think uh, the other thing, John, is that even if this case uh, were decided unfavorably by the Board of Immigration Appeals, um, which, as Lynette points out, is made up uh, now largely of appointees of Donald Trump, who, as we said, is not a friend of journalists or, um, or Mexican uh, citizens, 
But on the other hand, um, we have access to the federal courts. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, Emilio's case could go to federal court. And this gets to a uh, point that you made earlier that I think is really important. Emilio has a network and has resources. We're not gonna give up on this case. Uh, we are convinced it's a just case and we are gonna fight until justice is served. Um, not everybody is so lucky. And, um, and, and again, to get back to an earlier point, lucky, you're lucky that you have people who are willing to fight for you for 20 years so that you can breathe. Um, and, um, and what we ask particularly of our uh, fellow human beings of color is to be perfect. You have to be resilient. You have to be patient. You have to be kind in the face of the worst kind of cruelty. And if you're not, then you get deported or you get thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when people, students sometimes ask me, what is systemic racism? That's systemic racism. It's that one class of people has to be perfect and the rest of us can make a mistake and get away with it. And so I think, you know, Emilio has been pretty darn perfect and, um, and it's time for him to be able to breathe. Yeah, yeah. So what about the, uh, the, FOIA, the FOIA request is still uh, cooking, right? The FOIA request is still cooking. Uh, the, um, the, we are continuing to get pretty regularly um, enormous dumps of uh, data, emails. I think a lot of this is, uh, you and I have seen this, it's, um, it's kind of uh, censorship by over information. Uh, a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of duplicates of, I'm seeing a lot of uh, documents that are on the public record that I don't need, but I'm seeing a lot of emails with huge swaths of redactions. And that tells me uh, one of those emails has the, the information in it that DHS did not want to give to a judge. And so I think we're just going to have to keep that fight going too. Um, but, you know, we're stubborn. We're reporters. That's what we do. We keep uh, gnawing on ankles until we get the information. So uh, we're not giving up that fight either. But once the judge let uh, Emilio go, I immediately uh, and the press club immediately refiled our Freedom of Information Act request and our friends at the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press are doing a fantastic job representing us. Right. And one more, one more tool that we do have um, is that, you know, there is still a private bill. Uh, I was going to mention it. Yep. Yep. That is sitting before Congress that is advocating for Emilio to be granted asylum. And um, under the previous administration, that bill was largely symbolic because it didn't have a chance of passing, moving through the Senate and through the executive branch, right? That has changed now. And so the other thing that could happen, uh, there's a very simple, there's a very simple way um, to resolve this case for our, our, the, for two branches of our government to say there was an injustice here and we recognize that injustice and we are going to resolve this and grant asylum in this case. Uh, that is also still an option. There just has to be political will um, to pursue that option. Yeah, right. and the Justice Department could decide it's gonna stop wasting US taxpayer dollars on fighting Emilio's asylum and stipulate that he deserves it. That could end this case right away. It could end yeah. it, it could end it immediately. Yeah. Yep, There's, we've, we've gone through all the labyrinthine court cases and appeals and, and FOIA lawsuits and everything, but ultimately this could be solved very simply, either very by simple. Congress or by the executive branch or by both. Um, so, well, um, any other, any final thoughts uh, as uh, for, for moving forward on this? You know, I think it's worth saying we've been talking about one case here and we've been talking about one case um, with a lot of support, but in the time that Emilio has been seeking asylum in the United States, the danger to journalists in Mexico has not abated. 
Uh, in many ways, it has become worse. It has been recognized globally by journalism organizations as uh, the most dangerous place in the world for journalists outside of active war zones. Yeah. And, um, and so his case is one of many. And, uh, and in the years that he's been here, the type of um, autocratic governments that target journalists as enemies has only grown. And so there are other countries now where it is dangerous to be a journalist. It is deadly to be a journalist. And, and it is, we would like to believe because of how, what our first amendment that the United States should actually be setting standards for how journalists are treated and protected around the world. Um, and what does it say uh, when this is the stance that we choose to take? And how much more dangerous does it make journalists around the world when people know that the United States will not stand up for journalists? There is a global war on press freedom. And I would ask all of people, everyone who's not a journalist to decide which side are you on? Mm -hmm. Very important question. And of course, in all these countries that you just talked about, self-censorship -censor is, is an enormous problem. People may hold the job of journalists, but they know if they're gonna get their head chopped off, they're not gonna write a certain kind of story. And truth suffers everywhere because of that. So, but we at the Press Club and the Press Club Journalism Institute are gonna definitely keep the spotlight, not just on Emilio's case, but on all cases of this sort and of the general problem. And to learn more about uh, what we do, the websites are press.org for the Press Club and pressclubinstitute.org for the Press Club Journalism Institute. Lynette, Kathy, thank you very much. Um, I wish we had a, a better story to tell, but um, hopefully that uh, this story will have a, a happy ending uh, at some point. And we're gonna do our best to make sure that happens. And I wanna thank you both for joining us today. I can't wait to be at the fourth estate dinner for that celebration. Thank That'll you so all. much. And we're so thankful to the National Press Club for all it's doing for journalists around the world. Amen. Same from the University of Michigan. Thank you very much.